I'm Sam Taggart with Can't Knock This, host of the first ever Door-to-Door Con, bringing professional collaboration to the direct selling and door-to-door industry. Go register your seat for our event January 2018 at door2doorcon.com. All right, are we, are we Facebook Live? We're now? we're live. We're like on. So, Dave Allred, let me give you his background. 15 years in door to door. He doesn't look like he still looks like he's 20, um, and he has made millions in this space. Been one of the biggest regionals at Vivint. He's at Vivint Solar now as a as a recruiter, regional recruiter, and has done some phenomenal, phenomenal things. So I'm super excited. This is like a special treat to get him on the show. So. Yeah, excited to have you here, Sam. Thanks for the opportunity. Cool. So tell us a little bit about, let's like rewind 15 years ago. Okay. How'd you get in? Like, where did this all start? Sure. So I'm from Manti, Utah. It's a small town, Central Utah. Had never done sales. Nobody in my family has done sales before. And uh, I was going to Snow College down in Ephraim, and they had a recruiting booth set up. Had some Krispy Kreme donuts and candy and flyers or whatever set up there. And so I walked over, looked at it, and uh, it was interesting. I came back to my college dorm and they had a flyer there as well. And so my roommate and I decided to go check it out that evening. Had a pizza party downtown. Uh, Showed up to that event. They had their leather jackets on and uh, their Hummers out front. And back then Hummers were like super cool. So credit now, you know. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) That's right. But it was legit, you know. And I I was uh, was impressed and... uh, Decided to, to make that that jump into it and go spend four months out in Chicago. So coming from Manti, you know, Chicago seemed like a whole different world, and uh, I was excited to go take the opportunity and, and uh, jump into it. So, who recruited you? Um, it was Spencer Woolston. Oh, I've heard about him. So Spencer Woolston, he was the poster child of, of Pinnacle Security at the time. Uh, he sold 503 funded accounts, wow. which at that time had been the all-time record. And so he was down there recruiting, and um, I went out, never knocked any preseason with him. He gave me a, his door approach. I memorized it, went out, and you know, sold some preseason accounts. And showed up in Chicago, and let's just say it was a, it was a pretty crazy summer. Uh, it was a kind of tough year for the company as a whole. We started out as Pinnacle, then it was Alarm X, and that was Monotrox, all within one summer. Oh, wow. So a lot of change. Uh, most of the team quit. Um, you know, we had my, my manager bought me the book, Who Moved My Cheese? It's actually a great book. Yeah. But it kind of categorizes or summarizes that whole experience that summer with how things went. So most team quit. Um, one month into it, I had six installs and it was, I was struggling, man. Really? I'd always been pretty proficient at whatever I you know, set my mind to. And, and that was the most failure and, and, and struggle and challenge I'd had um, in my life, to be honest with you. And so, it was interesting. Luckily, I, I you know I stuck it out. Um, decided, committed to staying out all summer. They didn't send you home just because you did six. No, no, no. <laughs> I was actually like probably one of the better. Uh, oh, you were like one of the only ones <laughs> on the team. That's awesome. Um, and so, but luckily, I stuck it out and I did forty six my last month and one hundred eighteen total. So it wasn't anything crazy that I'm you know really proud about, but it was enough of a success story to be able to come back and stay in the game. Um, from that experience, I. I went back to Snow College and then Todd Peterson, the, the CEO, founder of, of Vivint, was actually down there and I met him. And Back when Todd did the recruiting and yeah, was he was like in, the, people, in yeah. the trenches down there. Um, had a great meeting with him. He came back the next day. We met at a uh, little Mexican restaurant down there in Ephraim and felt really good about it. Shook his hand and jumped on the, uh, the Vivint. Uh, Vivint Wagon. So, and I've been here for the last 14 years with Vivint, Vivint Solar, and it's been an amazing ride. So, so you've managed over 110 teams. 110 teams. 135,000 alarm accounts. 137,000. 37. Holy cow. I mean, that's more than most companies could ever say they've done in their whole existence. I mean, that, that that's a lot. Like, so you went from six accounts your first month to Mr. Like, I mean, we're sitting in a massive like mansion in Provo, like success. So this is this is this is cool. So I'm excited. So we're gonna go over three things. Um, one, the skill sets that you find every rep needs or person in door to door. Two, financial advice. Um, it's kind of fun. Me and Dave, we we both invest with some of the similar people, and um, 
and we crossed paths and we just kind of started jamming on finance and stuff like that and it was kind of cool to hear some of your philosophies so we'll kind of dive into that and then we'll go through and how you create vision and really grow leadership and some of the principles you've developed over the years so super excited for this awesome man. um so let's dive in so what what are the four skill sets that you you find most important in this space so I'd say over the last 15 years, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with thousands of guys and to see those that struggle with it, those that do well, and those that really thrive in the, in the space. And I feel like there's really four key attributes or skill sets for guys that really hit out of the park and have a, you know, a phenomenal experience. And so, um, and most of us have some of these. So I just ask, you know, think about what maybe you don't have yet. And then we take that weakness and focus on it and make that into a strength. But the first one is recruiting, right? That's the, the well, sorry, the first skill set is salesmanship. So that's the cornerstone we have on how to sell. You know, my first year, that's all I was focused on was you know, learning how to sell. Um, once you have the salesmanship down, and that's a profitable skill set on its own, right? When you combine these four together, that's where the magic really happens. Um, the second most valuable skill set is recruiting. Um, you know, sell, selling accounts is addition, but when you can recruit others, it becomes multiplication. And as you recruit, you can increase your influence, you increase your, your value to organization as well. So you have to learn how to recruit. Um, you know, plus it's fun. It's where you get to bring your friends into it, you get to bring other people in and create value for them. Some people get scared of recruiting. Like, <clears throat> we're... Like, I'm sure you, you've recruited thousands or whatever, but like when you say, hey, you get to bring your friends, you get to have fun, how do you turn recruiting into fun versus where a lot of people are scared of it or they're like, oh, like, I, I'm just not a recruiter. How do you shift that? Great question. First of all, if you're a salesman, you're a recruiter. It's pretty much the same thing. It's the same process that you go through. Um, you know, I, I think that it's really the story you tell yourself or it's the the paradigm or the perspective that you have of what you're doing. And if you really believe in the opportunity and you believe that this is a good thing and it can help other people, then it's so much easier to share that with your friends and your family and, and uh, potential recruits. I think a lot of times we, we have these limited, limited, limiting belief systems where we tell ourselves, hey, it might be too hard or maybe they'll fail and that will bad on us or you know, maybe I don't want to put my neck out and, and maybe, maybe I'll get shut down and I'll be able to get the recruit and there's some failure involved with that. But the reality is, um, you know, I've been, what I've been most excited about in my career is seeing guys come in and then them be successful with it, right? So you see that progression, you see them become financially independent, you see them get that skill set, become a sales manager, you know, move, move up and progress. That's a really exciting and you get a lot of fulfillment from that. If you're watching this live or listening to this, like this if Dave Allred's had an impact on your success, because I'm sure a lot of people that are watching this or listening are people that you've probably made an impact with and brought into the space or, you know, so if you're listening to this, give him a little shout out, give us a little fist bump or something like that. Like, awesome. he's, he's, he's freaking helped a lot of people. That's like probably what's gotten you to this point. You know, it's how many people can you help, you know, and the more people you can help, only up levels you. So. All the guys that know me well, they've heard this quote over and over, but it's Zig Ziglar, and he says, you can have everything you want in life to be helping up other people get what they want. And I think uh, somebody else mentioned that quote a while back on your podcast as well, but I love that. It's actually my all-time favorite quote, and I really believe that. If you're focused on helping other people and you're outside yourself, it shows authenticity, it shows you know sincerity, and people are drawn to that. So, is there any is there any specific person or story that you can think of throughout your career that you've, you know, you saw a guy go from rags to riches, or you saw a guy like, you know, you took him under your wing and you were like, man, like look at him today. Like, is there anybody that stands out off the top of your head that you're like, man, this this is somebody I felt like I really did make a difference with. I um, mean, there's a lot, a lot of stories uh, in that there. You know, I don't really want to <laughs> single out one individual, but. Um, I mean, there's a lot of people that come to mind on that. Um, you have a, uh, I mean, there's seriously a ton of guys that come to mind on that. I, I think that the, the, for all of us that are in management positions, when you look at your, your career, you know, there's one thing looking at your own personal self, your own personal success, 
but the true mark of a leader is how many other people have you helped and how many other people have you helped to uh, advance and to be able to progress and you know to follow in your footsteps um, and that kind of leads into the third point our skill set which is management so the third most valuable skill set is managing and it's managing people it's managing problems it's managing uh, situations and as you and that's a very profitable skill set on its own right so salesmanship recruiting and managing um, but the fourth one is where I, where it really gets fun and that is people development and that goes back to your question and that's where you're able to you know you, you've got this salesmanship down you figure out how to manage you've got recruits you even have sales managers potentially and that's how do I develop these individuals to be able to become their, their best self and, and to be able to be more productive and, and, and add more value. And that is where the, the magic is, man. That, that is, it's such a fun experience. And, you know, look back at the last 15 years, the money's awesome. You know, the opportunity's been awesome experiences. But uh, seeing other people develop and being able to contribute to that, that's a really special yeah, because so I, I, I've had a lot of small companies, a lot of people that, you know, managers that are like, you know, I, I call it the lazy man of recruiting. It's like, oh, I'll just go buy this guy that's really good that somebody else already developed and just bring him to my organization. And that creates this loyalty, you know, it never really ends up well. What's done well for you is you've been able to take a guy from nothing to amazing and it creates a long term relationship and loyalty and stuff like that. So, kind of, what are some of the tricks or tips that you would give somebody from a people development like what how do you get somebody that you know hasn't done sales or hasn't done you know if they're new to this and you take them from rep to leader to regional like how, like what are some tricks there that you found helpful so the first thing i would say is you have to retain your people right so you invest all that work into them whatnot i look back at my the two years i managed the team so when I came over from Pinnacle to Vivint, uh, uh, we went out to Denver and, and we were the, the number three team in the, in the, in the country and uh, top first year team that year. But what I was most proud about was we had 17 reps start the summer and we finished with 16. Wow. And the following year we went to the Bay Area and we were the number two team in the industry with 2,600 accounts. And we started out with 34 reps and we were with 30 reps. So wow. not quite as good, but still, I was really proud of that. Um, but you have to be able to retain your people, right? Or you hear stories of people starting with 30 and finishing with six. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's way, just like, way, way too often, and, and, unfortunately. And, unfortunately, and it's like, like if we look and kind of went back and it's like, okay, there's a difference between what you did and what they did. And that's what we kind of want to dissect here. Love it. And so, um, so you have to retain your people, otherwise it's really hard to rebuild every single year to start over. Um, I'd also say on that same note is you've got to build your, your on, on a strong foundation, right? We see so many reps and leaders that they're always looking for the greener grass, right? It's always a better opportunity, better pay skill somewhere else. But my opinion on that is that, you know, the grass is greenest where you, you fertilize it or you water it the most. And, you know, I've, you know, with spending the last 14 years at Vivint, Vivint Solar, I've been really grateful for that. You know, I see a lot of my friends that were in the industry back when I first started and nobody's been able to weather the storm. A very few guys have weathered the storms in other companies. Now, with that being said, if you're at a company where the foundation's shaky or it's built on sand, uh, then yeah, maybe you know you need to look at other opportunities where you can put your roots down and, and build something real on a strong foundation. But generally speaking, I think we're really we're way too quick to always you know look for other opportunities when the times get hard. We're always going to have peaks and valleys in our career, and those that can weather the storm and have you know that focus that tenacity that relentless pursuit of success they usually do just fine so, so so how do you as a leader sorry to cut you off but like as a leader you have a rep that maybe he's been with you a year in a second year it didn't go as well as he was expecting and how do you help that rep be like hey we all have a bad year that doesn't mean you need to like throw your towel in and be like I'm going to some other company because they're saying this and this like because a lot of times, like some people feel like, oh, if I didn't beat my last year, I'm, I'm, I need to quit. Like I'm doing something wrong. So how do you, as a leader, manage those emotions of reps that may, may not be able to face the challenging of weathering the storm and, and retain them? Well, first of all, that's human nature, right? If we're not progressing and doing better, 
then we're not growing and we there's not a lot of energy there. So anytime that somebody, whether it's a rep or a manager, is not progressing and moving forward, that's a big red flag for me. Right? If I have a rep that's gone backwards, um, I need to I need to fix something. And you always want to take accountability for yourself, right? So extreme ownership. That's on me as the leader. Because ultimately everything falls back on us as the leader, right? Whether we agree with it or not. The right mentality is everything falls back on us. Any production or lack of production, it's, it's, it's on us. And so, first of all, you've got to um, you know, address that, take, take responsibility for it. The second thing I would say is, is everybody is very different. And one thing that I, I feel like we did well, I did well in my early stages of management was being able to manage different types of people. Okay? You have your all-stars, you have your, 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 your middle of the pack guys, you have your low performers. And everybody is motivated by different things, right? The bottom performers, maybe they're motivated by you know, simply not quitting. Maybe it's because their parents didn't think they could succeed at the job. You know, maybe it's because you know, they just need to, they want to learn from the experience. Your top performers, they're probably motivated by something completely different from that. They're motivated by competition, by the scorecard, the rankings, you know, the incentives, the opportunity to manage next year. But everybody is very different in what drives them. <clears throat> and I think a key characteristic of of top leadership is to be able to understand what drives the individual and then to cater how you know how you manage that individual. You've got to motivate them differently based on you know, where they fall. Yeah, and that kind of leads us into one of the topics we're going to talk about is vision because everybody also has different visions, different paths that they're really trying to accomplish and really dialing that in and, and that's something we're going to talk about. So, sure. um, But before, like, just to kind of recap, anything else that you want to talk about on the four skill sets. So you, the, to kind of recap, the first one, sales skills, recruiting, management, and people development. Is there any other plugs that you'd want to add into that? I would just say that, um, you know, most of you listening to this podcast, you probably have maybe one or two, maybe three of those, those, those skill sets. And so just do a self-assessment. So, hey, you know, which of those four am I lacking in? And then simply dedicate some time, invest your time, resources, your energy into turning that from a weakness to a strength. And that's the beautiful thing about this industry and about um, sales leadership is it's a continual uh, evolution, right? We're always growing, we're always getting better. And so, um, and, I, and I wouldn't say you have to be perfect at all four of those, just be proficient in those four skill sets. And no matter what industry you're in or will be in, you're gonna be very valuable, right? And when I say valuable, you know, valuable, uh, money follows value, right? Simple as that. And so if you can create a lot of value in business, you're always going to be able to be very profitable as well. For sure. And that's like really the main points of door door con are sales, leadership, and recruiting, and then everything underneath those. And that's like really the main focus of the speakers. And so... You know, the funny part is it's like it just so aligns and so many people try to like put their own spin on it. Like, oh, we focus on this and we do this. And it's like, really, you just get good at those four things. You make a hell of a lot of money That's doing right. this. That's like, right. I mean, it, it, and some people throw throw like they're just like, oh, but I'm not a good recruiter. I'm like, well, do you want to be good at this job? Well, get good at recruiting. Cause, you have to be. You know what I mean? If like, you want to create a legacy for yourself and you know a real name for yourself in this space, you have to be a great recruiter. Yeah. And, it, it, and, and, and stop like coming out with this victim or excuse or I don't have a network or I don't have this or I'm not outgoing or I, I don't have big muscles. Whatever your excuse is because like we all think of like some excuse, but it's like the fact of the matter is like – just get good at it. You can learn a certain skill, like you were saying, which yeah. is which is cool. So yeah, I'm excited. Speaking of recruiting, yeah. do you mind if I? Because um, recruiting has been something I've been very passionate about for a long time. I've had the opportunity to recruit, I don't know, thousands of, of, of individuals. I door to door. Um, I feel there's a few things for those of you that are just getting started in recruiting. I just want to share with you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Throw it in. So one is ABR. So always be recruiting, right? Always be recruiting. It's that simple. No matter where you are, you've always got to have that recruiting mentality. Um, two is to listen. So we have two ears, one mouth, use them accordingly. You learn how to listen. Most sell, most recruiting presentations are just pitch, 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 pitch. Do you have any questions? What do you think? Do you want to do it? Instead, it should be about listening to the individual and understanding them. Um, the third thing is, is to write down notes throughout the recruiting presentation or throughout the conversation. In my phone, I have about 500, maybe 600 notes of everybody I've met with in the last eight years. 
and it has uh, the notes of you know who they are, their name, their family situation, their background. Uh, so do you do that studying. when they're when right they're talking? talking to so do you let them know? You're like, hey, I'm taking notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not texting I'm my wife. Some, I'm like, I have terrible memory. I'm taking some notes real quick so I can remember what we talked about. And uh, it shows the recruit that you care enough, and you're actually listening to what they're saying. And I'll go through and I'll write down there, you know, what they studied, what their aspirations are, what their dreams are, you know, what three things are they'd want to get out of this job, you know, how much money they need to earn in a year to cover their costs, their needs, what they'd want to make in a year. My standard questions. And I have it all there in a note on my phone. And I can't tell you how many times it's come back to help me out. So last week I had a guy come in six years ago when I met with him. I pull up his note, have all his, 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 his stuff right there, details. And that was really cool to him that you know I kept that and I still and that you remember new situation. Yep, honestly, yeah, I probably didn't say, "Hey, let me pull my notes up here for you." I just kind of reached through them and and then you know went over with them. So anyway, that's the best practice: keep notes. You know, even if it's just two weeks later, look back and reflect back on you know their needs and what they're all about. I think that's powerful in recruiting. Um, the fourth thing is is to follow up with recruits. So I think that's where we drop the ball the most in recruiting. You know, we do a really good job of getting the, you know, the meeting set up, we present to them, but then there's not good, effective follow-up after that point. And so um, I would ask, you know, kind of the fifth, the transition into the fifth one is have good systems in place. So whether that's a spreadsheet, whether it's post notes on the wall, maybe your company has a system built out, but you need to have your recruiting pool, you know, your recruits in progress and your signed recruits, but it's gotta be systematic so it's scalable and you can handle, you know, mass quantity of recruits. Yeah, because you can only handle one or two or three at a time if you're not really organized. I'm like, okay, I gotta call these five people today, call these six people tomorrow, I'm setting up interviews for these days, like, and just having a, a flow helps you kind of recruit at a, at a mass level versus the onesies and twosies. You got it. Um, cool, no, that, that was a great plug. Feel free to plug in anytime. <laughs> like this is all about you. So let's kind of shift gears into vision. You know, as we help and um, develop these people, you know, the last principle is like, okay, let's let's dive into people development. Well, a big part of that is really helping them find their true identity, find their vision, find their holy cause. And we always talk about like what's your why, right? But like, I think there's right and right and wrong ways to do it. And I think there's some people that just suck at it and they're like, hey, what's your why? Like, oh, let's all write down our whys. And then there's people that are like, man, I like help this guy really uncover and discover like who he truly is and what he wants. Man, I, we could talk about vision for the entire podcast. I feel like this is one of the most underrated or, I mean, we, we miss out on, on casting vision way too often in this industry. And, you know, I really feel like it's the... Uh, it's the secret sauce. It's what really drives people. As, as we all know, this can be a challenging industry, right? There's a lot of failure, a lot of rejection, a lot of, you know, kind of tough times. It's kind of a, a feast and famine sometimes with, you know, abundance and some scarcity. And I feel like we have to have good vision. And a lot of companies, a lot of regions, a lot of teams just don't, don't, have, don't have it. And, but it's something you have to, you have to, you have to design and you have to purposefully implement into your culture and uh, so you know, how, do, how do we do that and for me personally it's always it always starts with thinking about the end so I start with the end okay you, you envision what do you want the team culture to be like what do you best case scenario how do you see this playing out you know, where do you want to get to in your in your career where do you want to get to this summer you know with this individual rep where do you see him what's his best Situation. What's his what's what's his potential, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, looking at the potential, best case potential, and then reverse engineering from there with what you need to do to make sure you're on course to hit that potential. So funny, funny plug for anybody that's listening or watching this. When I got to Dave's house, he's like, "Hey, can I show you this fun little thing I've been working yeah, on?" Yeah, tell him. <laughs> yeah. right. He's All like, right. he's like, oh, you know, I just read the Tools of Titans. I was like, oh, great book. He's like, look what I made. He literally put like a twenty-something page like book together about his end, and I'm like, he literally wrote his eulogy. I'm like, wait, you literally wrote your <laughs> eulogy? When we talk about, he's so dialed in with his vision. He even has his eulogy written. That's like he embodies it. He lives it. But he went through family time management, um, finances, physical, spiritual. I mean, you went through all these different categories and it was really cool to see how dialed in, you know, he had his, his percentages. He's like, I'm going to spend 
36%, 36 36.26% of my time on business and like, you know, and just how he has really embodied this whole end in mind philosophy. And it's, it's cool. Cause I'm sure, you know, even just sitting in this house I and mean, we were in a multi-million dollar home of his and it's like three years in the making. You're like, one day I will live in a modern house with this and this, and it'll have this and it'll have this. And it's like, now it happens. It's manifesting. No, it's, it's true. Um, you know, I showed this humbly, but you know, five I'll years, brag about him. Stuck. <laughs> five years ago, it was, I wrote down on a spreadsheet. Hey, you know, I want to, you know, my dream home is this, 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 and this detailed out very, very, very detailed out. Right. And you know, we're grateful that, um, to be able to have that now. Right. But it's not just the house, but it's I look at all things with my finances, with, um, with business, with, you know, growing a region with what I want to do my first year as a manager, um, even my first year as a, as a rep, you know, we have to envision what we really want to accomplish. And, and I think a lot of times we just go through life living day by day without really focusing on the destination, right? We're so focused and micro focused on the task at hand and the day at hand. And we don't really take time to reflect on what we really, what's really important to us, you know, what we're really passionate about, what really makes us happy. When you mentioned the eulogy, that probably sounds weird, but the practice there is is that forces you to think about what you, you'd want your friends, your neighbors, your family to say about you uh, at your funeral, right? And that it's a great way to reflect back on what really drives you, what makes you happy, what you're about, and what's important to you as an individual. So that's why I did the eulogy. But um, on that same note, I was uh, some of you guys know James Lawrence, the Iron Cowboy. He's actually been speaking at the DG Club, right? Yeah. Stud, awesome. He, and these guys are like buddies, though. You yeah. guys like ran together. Yeah, and, I've done his uh, Iron Cowboy Docs uh, three lay race a few times with him, and I was actually golfing with him <clears throat> about two weeks ago. And he shared a quote with me, and I'm, I'm going to botch this, but he said, um, "Choose, choose the destination, then the well, choose choose the destination." Then select the course. Don't select the destination and then choose the I totally course. Messed, I totally messed that up. Okay. Yes. Yeah, but so basically, you know, choose the destination and then and then you select your course versus you know select your course and then choose your destination. Bottom line is we have to choose what we really want to get to, what we want to accomplish, and then we just simply reverse engineer that. It's really not that hard. But I think as a leader, going back to vision, it's a powerful thing to be able to, to you know, help an individual. We have reps that are struggling with failure, with self-doubt, with limiting belief systems. And if we as a leader can come in and show them the vision of what we see in them, and it's not just artificially propping them up, it's saying, hey man, in, I see greatness in you. I see this potential. I see you as a manager. I see you as a top, uh, top rep in the company next year. You know, but, it, but it's honest, it's sincere, it's authentic. Well, everybody has this natural tendency to beat themselves up. We all don't. It's, it's really hard for us to see our own potential. It's easy to see somebody else's. And so by having a leader actually show us, like, this is what I see in you, really brings out the best in people. You know, one, one of my favorite quotes is that trust is the highest form of motivation. Trust is the highest form of human motivation. And sometimes all the guys need from us is saying, hey, man, I, I trust in you. I have faith in you. I believe in you. Uh, you have great potential. And that means a lot. Think about it. If you have a leader that comes and says that to you and it's heartfelt, man, you're going to do everything you can to not disappoint, you know, that expectation that's been outlined for you. So, that's cool. Um, you know, and, and, and going back to, motive, to vision, you know, also for those of you, if you're married or you have a significant other, same thing. You know, it can be a kind of a crazy ride, crazy experience, crazy journey here. But casting vision with your significant other and your family is very important as well. You've got to be on the same mission together. And uh, I know with my wife, I'm really grateful for the fact that she's been so supportive. You know, I couldn't have done what we've done without her by my side. And, and understanding the imbalance that this job sometimes uh, requires. And uh, speaking of imbalance, uh, I wanted to mention this. I've thought a lot about balance through the years in family. My family is very important to me. My number one thing in my life is you know, I want to be a great husband, a great, a great husband and a great father. Um, so balance is important to me, but I think balance is a fallacy. I think that balance is, 
Yeah, there's no such thing as as balance. Yeah, because if you really did it, uh, if you put something on a scale, work would probably outweigh it from a time like three hours, three hours, three hours, three hours. Is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah, you know, one uh, one quote is that uh, imbalance is the price of greatness. And you look at most people that have done great things in their lives, and there's definitely some imbalance there. Um, I feel like, you know, I don't want to be really bad. I, I think a balanced life is a mediocre life. But so I don't want to be balanced. I want to be, I want it all. I want to be a great father. I want to be a great husband. I want to be a great businessman. I want to be great with my finances. I want to be great with giving back and being charitable. I want to be great at those things. You're going to be unbalanced in every category. Pretty much. That's cool. Pretty, pretty I much. like that. Be unbalanced. Be unbalanced, but in everything. In everything. You know, don't don't settle for what other might call the status quo. You know, what what, what is mediocrity? Um, you know, so so that's something that I feel strongly about. Uh, Keith Nelson it was uh, one of the co-founders of of Vivint. He he talked about this topic a few years back, and he said that Dave uh, balance. It's all about seasonality. <clears throat> There's a time and a place. So sometimes you have to grind. You have to go hard. You have to go over 12, 15 hour days. Maybe it's in the summertime, maybe it's finishing out August, hitting a pay scale level, maybe it's an incentive, a competition, maybe it's a startup, maybe it's a merger acquisition going on through business. But sometimes you have to give everything you have, and it's very unbalanced. But then on the flip side, maybe you get back in the summer and you go out and you go hunting, or you go and you take a, you know, a really long vacation, or maybe it's Sundays. Uh, maybe you rest on Sundays and it's a time with your family. But you gotta find your balance, but the idea of just a balanced, you know, lifestyle, lifestyle, I feel like, you know, that's going to, for a lot of guys, that's more of an excuse because they don't want to do the work. And so it's like a, a, a crutch, you know, I want this balance. I think balance is a fallacy. That's interesting. I love that. No, and I, and, and it's, it's actually a really cool perspective because at the end of the day, like name me somebody that's really crushing it, that is perfectly balanced using that as like their crutch right it's hard to find it's hard to find so so going back to vision i had one question just kind of rewinds this a little bit you're a manager you're recruiting husband wife how do you cast a vision with the wife when she's like dude i i, I don't want to move to freaking who knows where and i don't support door to door i would rather you go stay in school like how do you help get wife on board as a leader or a recruiter so if I'm recruiting a wife and a husband, honestly, I'm talking to the wife 90% of the time um, and helping you know, get her on board. So the majority of the recruiting is actually happening with the wife, to be honest with you. Uh, besides that, it's the same thing. It's just listening. You know, seek first to understand before um, trying to be understood and just really ask questions. You know, there's reasons for that. So dig into it, ask the questions, figure out the underlying issues, and then do your best to pre pre present a solution. And if you can't get a solution for them, then maybe it's not the right fit. I think in recruiting, a lot of times we go into, it's like, no matter what, I'm going to win this recruiting battle. Because we're all competitive, right? We're all kind of alpha. You know, we're used to winning and we, wanna, we don't want to lose in a recruiting situation. Sometimes it's just not a good fit. And if that's the case, then you've got to be able to, to make that distinction and respect that. But uh, one of you speak with the, the wife a lot, ask great questions. Um, I have bought a few purposes Purses for wives and stuff, you know, to help get them on on page. Maybe hire her as an OA, uh, give her a position on the team so she feels like she's, you know, she has a, uh, she's adding value for the team as well. Yeah, kind of get them enrolled in like the whole culture of like, hey, you play a big role in this too. One one more thing on vision that I wanted to share is I look back at my career and that first summer, so I was struggling and it was it was it was ugly, it was bad. Um, I'm in Chicago and you know I'm sitting midway through the summer, it was actually the middle of July, and I was still not doing great. Um, and the regional manager came out and he sat down with me and he talked about how I could be a, a, a manager the next year if I sold 100 funded accounts. And it's the first time I ever thought about being a manager, I didn't know an opportunity was gonna be there. He's like, hey, your performance is not even close, but if you could do 100 accounts this summer, this would be an opportunity for you. I put you had the, the, the personality for it, you could do well with it. And at that point, the, the, the switch flipped for me, and I saw something bigger than just myself. 
and I really, you know, kind of captured my heart and my mind. I was like, okay, this could be really cool. This could be something that, you know, is a life changing opportunity. And if it wasn't for that conversation, I don't think I ever would have went out and paid that price or sacrificed so much in July to hit, you know, 46 installs my last month. And so that was a great example to me of, of casting vision. Somebody took time to sit down with me, struggling first year rep, and to instill confidence and, and vision in me and uh, change the game for me. So I'm super grateful for that. Also, um, my first year as a regional manager, uh, the the owners, I, I was going to UBS, 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 yeah. UBS, yeah. And I had nine, nine courses left to finish my, my bachelor's in business. And uh, they offered me a, a regional position and they strongly encouraged me to not continue going to school because they wanted to be a year round job where I put 100% of my time and effort into the job. As a regional, and that's a lot more of a year round process. And, uh, and, and I was dead set on my bachelor's, but I decided to pull out of that and we'll say temporarily suspend that. that. Yeah, I got my associates. I'm proud of that. Hey, hey me too. <laughs> yes. we, got, we got degrees, bro. We got we degrees. Got degrees. <laughs> but, you know, so I did that. So I jumped out of uh, school and I, and I went full, you know, dive, dive into this thing head first. And, uh, but you can't hindsight. be successful without a degree, right? Uh, it's a degree, <laughs> man. We should do a whole podcast <laughs> on that. So that's it. Uh, just but, 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 you know, in hindsight, that was, they were able to create this vision for me of what that job could become if I gave it 110%. And I was stoked about it and I went full, you know, full steam ahead in that direction. But that was the only result of, of vision, of, of that vision. Somebody was like, look, like take this serious, treat it like a real job. And, th and that's the same thing that happened with me. It was like, man, I'm trading time for money and money for time going to school. If I had just said, man, for the next five years, I'm gonna do this hard. And hard means preseason, recruiting, building, same thing happened to me. But I think a lot of times as leaders, we, we assume that our, our employees or our reps, they already know this stuff. Like they, they should figure that out. They should figure out their own vision. But I feel like one of the, the greatest attribute, you know, greatest opportunities of a leader is the ability to cast, is the opportunity to cast vision. Um, and I think it's, a, it's actually a mark of a great leader. Huge. Okay, so let's shift gears. Now we're going to kind of dive into finance, which is always so intricate and fun for me to jam on. So you've done some interesting, creative things. Um, I actually have a group coming to Door to Work on called the Norton Group. So give them a I shout out. Guys, really well. And uh, the guy that's speaking raised, you know, he had $100,000 in college. Is that he, Kurt Brown? Yeah, Kurt Brown. He took it to a $30 million fund bought by Wall Street, and then he took it to a multi-billion dollar fund. I mean, it, it's like his story. So th that's one of the reasons you go to door work on is because a lot of it, we have an accountant, real, two real estate people, and a finance group coming to speak. And But it's fun because like you've done a lot of real estate, and the FIG group, Steve's speaking too. So Steve Bond's sponsoring and speaking. So the FIG group and the Norton group, which you know awesome. as well. So, you know, Steve, you've done millions of dollars of investment with him, and um, this guy did 300 million in revenue in the last three years. And it's crazy to see, you know, a real estate investor like that. And he's speaking at DoorDoc on too, on how to get into real estate. But um, how, how, yeah, Jan, tell me about your philosophy on finance and, and our job and how this works. So first of all, props to you, man, for getting those guys to come out. So yeah. Kurt Brown, awesome, Steve Bond, those guys are, are best in class. So um, that's awesome. Yeah, Good they're both guys. sponsoring it. Yeah. I'm excited. That's going to be a great event. Um, so I'll just preface it saying that I grew up in Manti, small town. Um, we had kind of a you know, very humble beginnings. We definitely never talked about money at, at all, ever, in our household. Um, didn't really have you know, a lot to, to, to work with. Uh, I was in, 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 in Manti, the top economy is actually turkey farming. So I was a, a turkey, I may or may not have been a turkey farmer when I was 14 <laughs> and 15 years old. Awesome. So, and then I, I graduated into uh, manufacturing. So I, I worked on making fiberglass uh, flagpoles for a year. So I went from making $8 to $10. So I was like balling, I was, you know, kind of Killing making it, it getting, getting up there. And, uh, and then I, you know, I went to college, some college, and they never talked about um, personal finances, ever. And they talked about accounting, they talked about calculus, but they don't ever talk about personal finances, which is still crazy to me. I understand why the home education system 
they don't really talk to I wonder, about. And, and this is just my philosophy, but I wonder if it's almost like they feel like they may offend people that are lower class, higher class. You know what I mean? Like, is it almost like a, oh, we want to be neutral and equal, but it's like, I'm sorry, the real world has classes. There's called the lower class and upper class for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't, I mean, maybe, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. But even just like the basics. I mean, the basic, I mean, yeah. The it's like, basic stuff, you know? They're and tricking you. They want you to stay in the lower class. Maybe, maybe that's the case. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's the case. Um, and, and so my first summer, I made decent money, came back. My second summer as a manager, I made, you know, more than I ever actually had aspired to in a year. At that point, I'm like, hey, I got to figure out how to, you know, how to manage my money. Like, what do I do with this? And at that point, I, I made the decision to uh, educate myself on, on finances. And so I started listening to podcasts, reading books, um, and took it upon myself to, to surround myself with the smartest advisors, financial advisors that I could, and to really soak it all in and try to, to master this game. And so I'm definitely not an expert at it, um, uh, but I, I've enjoyed it a lot. And so one thing I've loved doing with my, my reps and my managers is to teach about the fundamentals of, of money, you know, the, 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 about investment fundamentals, if you will. And, and, and actually, I've gotten a great response from you guys. I feel like if, as a leader, you can go out of your way and share value and share knowledge with somebody to help them, not just how to make more money, but how to manage that money and to be a responsible steward over their capital. That's powerful, and I feel like I've gotten a lot of you know raving fans and, and a lot of really good feedback from from doing so. Yeah. Have, you, have you ever had like your leaders ever spend time to you know share an idea on how to invest? Never. Never. And, and I've so, always wanted. Like I literally like always would hope. Hey man, come in on this uh, this fund with me. Hey, like we need another fifty grand. You want to like throw it in and we're buying this apartment comp. Like never. And I've always wanted you know I, I just brought one of my reps to a real estate investment class we're actually going tomorrow again to a flip class and I'm like hey just come with me and he was like really and I was like yeah and I you know for me I'm like they see me doing it but it's like why not get them to do it it's not like a secret it's like yeah let's teach them yeah you know and, and the reality is we work so hard to make our money right I yeah mean, we we work we do a very hard job and so it's made, you know, I've been sad a lot. Of, I've seen a lot of guys that make great money and they go and they blow it off. They're irresponsible for their money, right? And what I see even more so is, you know, a guy is making this much money on average and then all of a sudden he starts making like this. And so what happens to his cost of living? It follows exactly, right? So he, he starts making more, his cost of living goes up and he's really not saving or investing anything. He's just spending more money. And so, which is unfortunate because we're young where we have, most people doing this job are relatively young, right? And so we have time on our side and we have the power of compound interest and a real estate where you know it appreciates and there's tax benefits. And so I just feel like there's been a gap there in our industry where nobody really talks too much about this and, and it's really important. And if we're smart about it, we can put ourselves in a really good situation in the future. So so I've gone on my way to, to talk about that a lot. Um, you know, some people think that maybe money's bad. We don't talk about it openly. I disagree. I think that money is a magnifier. It's a facilitator. It magnifies whatever you're already about. You know, if you're selfish, if you have bad vices, if whatever, then that's going to make it worse. If you are charitable, if you like to give back, if you like to, you know, do business, that's going to help magnify and enable those those things that you want to do. Yeah. And uh, I know for me, a big motivator has been to provide a great quality of life for my family. You know, that really fires me up. Um, it's what I wake up to. And I get I get stoked about. Um, it was interesting, like when I first got here, um, he gave me a tour and he's like, everything I did in this house had to do with how to make my kids' lives a really cool experience. And he like mapped out certain gates to jump into the foam pit, to like the pool deck, to the rooms. He's like, I want to just be masculine for the boy and he's into this and this. And it's like, it, it, you could see the energy and the fire in your eyes when yeah. you just talked about it. And That's cool like, you know. So. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that being successful is our duty. Uh, you know, we're all ordained for greatness and and we need to expect that from ourselves unfortunately we have these limiting belief systems or these stories we tell ourselves about how you know we're not you know we, sh we shouldn't be as successful as maybe we should be um, Zig Ziglar says that we always make within about 10% of what we truly believe that we should not what we say we want or what we 
Yeah, I was going to say, there's a big difference between... My goal is to make 100 grand. It's like, no, you truly believe versus... Yes. It's powerful. I think that when you really dive into it and you get get real with yourself, that's actually pretty pretty accurate. How do you know what you truly believe? That's a great question. Sounds probably too deep for me. I don't know. That's a good question. So, like, for example, because I've I've lived by this, and, and, and what's crazy is sometimes we have unconscious beliefs that we don't even know just due to the fact of our circumstance like we grew up and our parents were teachers and they made 50 grand and I lived on 50 grand and all the people around me make 50 grand and we don't even realize but that's all we know and it was crazy like one thing that like actually increased my belief is I went to San Francisco for the first time and I was like what the heck I'm looking on Zillow and every house is worth over a million dollars and I was like how do people pay their mortgage when you know they're just like what do they do for work they don't knock on doors like what like how do, how do they do this and one thing i found is when you truly dive into like what is my belief well first off it has to do with like knowing where your dollars and cents are going if you know how to live on 50 grand you're going to live on 50 grand but if you know you can live on 50 grand but you know your dollars and cents are going to go towards an investment so like my first breakthrough is like I need 40 grand as a down payment for my first real estate property. And I was so committed to getting my first real estate property. And I could live on 30 grand. So I made, or 80 grand. I was like, sweet. But that was my true belief was like, yeah. I have to make 80 grand because I'm living on this and I'm putting this much money into this. Totally agree with you. So I always aspired as a, you know, in school and when I was young, one day I'm gonna make 100 grand. <laughs> like that's, that was the- Well, that's what everybody says, says, right? Making, making it, right? And uh, so, you know, it's just, it, 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 it comes down to having an abundance mentality, right? For sure. And then I'd say for me, a lot of it was, you know, it's just as, as, you, as you go. So as you push yourself and you progress and, and you figure out what your potential is, then you keep always pushing that a little bit further. And secondly, it's about associating with other people that you want to aspire to be around, right? So if I'm hanging out with, say, executives or the owners of, of a company and they're flying around on a private jet and they're... You know, living this, they, you know, like their 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 expectation levels. Yeah, hundred grand is like something. I put that on black if I'm yeah. not even care. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean to those type yeah. of people. But it's like, for some as a as a kid, you're like, man, I made it. Yeah. Now you start thinking so much differently. So a lot of it has to do with who you associate with. It's yeah. so true. And that carries for all aspects of life, right? It's not just uh, just about money. You know, I I strongly believe that. Um, we we have there's there's a fixed mindset and there's a growth mindset and everybody has one of the two either you have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset and unfortunately those with a fixed mindset they feel like it is what it is wherever they're at now it's out of their control life happens to them not for them and they're kind of it's a victim mentality right and they're they're kind of stuck where they are I don't agree with that at all. I feel like that's an, maybe that's an easy way to look at it, but the truth is we're all, the, the greatest thing about man is our ability to change ourselves, right? We can look at our, our circumstances, our environment, and consciously make changes and course corrections that alter who we are and our destination and where we're headed to. And that's an, an amazing thing. It's actually a, a, a pretty, it's, that's a blessing, right? We have yeah. the ability to control our future. And uh, with that, with that acknowledgement comes responsibility, though, right? If we're not in the situation we want to be, we have to take ownership for that. That's that's on me. That's because I've made some poor decisions, or I haven't done this, right? Yeah. But I truly believe that we all, you know, having a a, a growth mentality is is an abundance mentality. It allows us to to grow and to always be pushing ourselves. And I find myself doing weird things to push myself, right? Like. Um, those triathlons, right? I didn't want to do that. It's crazy. I, I do. You know, skydiving, I, I never really wanted to, but. You're hiking Everest next year? Hiking Everest in April. <laughs> why? Just dope, because, why? Like, just cause next, why just not? pushing the limit, dude. My What's favorite quote is why, why not? Like, why not? Why not? Yeah, yeah and I have actually hiked to uh, King's the, Peak. The Y. <laughs> the Y, yeah, I was gonna say so, the Y. I'm kind of a mountaineer. I love it. Love it. Why not? Um, right? Um, so we're living on time. Sure. So I'm going to finish up with one last question. And then, no, but honestly, like, I'm like, I'm ready to go rewatch this. So if you're watching this or listening to this, like, shed some love, share this or comment on here, 
tell Dave how awesome share your favorite thing um, but one last question would be if you had one piece of advice you could give any leader rep whoever you, I mean just the industry I mean we're talking pests we're talking everybody's watching this so what advice would you would you give them knowing what you know now <laughs> um, I got a few okay. okay so one I would say realize that everybody wants to level up um, they want to level up in their relationships in their in their business and in their income and in their salesmanship their leadership in in everything right we always want to we want to grow we want to level up and so if you can be the guy the leader that can help other people level up that's a great position to be in and you know, call it the law of the lid you know we can't help other people grow past where we are personally so take it upon yourself to study leadership to always be increasing your own personal capacity to add value and that will help other people will help you to help other people level up. Okay. Love that. Um, secondly, I would say embrace the suck. And that's one of my favorite trainings over the years, but it comes from the Navy SEALs Hell Week. Okay. It's embrace the suck. They say it a lot uh, in that Hell Week. And it means, you know, do the things that are hard. If something's hard or you're scared of it, it probably means you should be doing that thing. And, uh, you know, Will Smith says that you're not truly living unless you're outside your comfort zone. And I, I believe that. So don't be afraid to do the things that, that suck, that are hard. Okay. And, and, and a lot of times, this job sucks. Like, Absolutely. we can't sugarcoat it. You Absolutely. can't, like, put a bow on it and make it feel good. Like, it sucks. And embrace that. Let's like, embrace that's it. the grind. That's what we do. That's, that's like, how. I'm sure there were days back at 10, 5, however many years ago, still today, that you're like, I just want to crawl up in a little ball and hide like this sucks and it's just like embracing that and being like but that's what makes me who I am absolutely that's where we grow that's where we find out who we really are so the third thing I'd want to say for a new recruit new manager a new guy coming into this is is don't it, it, don't always don't ask where can I make the most money ask yourself where can I create the most value and this took me several years to understand, but you know, it's not just about the pay scale or the money or the number. Where can I create the most value? Because wherever you create the most value is where you're most profitable. Okay, money follows value, so figure out where you're most valuable. Um, the fourth thing I'd want to say would be to uh, build a reputation based on doing what you say you will do. Uh, if you want to build something big, you have to have that as your reputation. So. You say you're going to do something, do it. It's that simple. And, and it happens so much in this industry, the opposite. Yeah. And it's, it's sad. It's unfortunate. Um, if, if, you, if, you can't, if you say you're going to do something you cannot do it, at least have the brutally honest conversation and, and, and address it with the individual. And, hey, man, I, I told you I was going to come and knock with you uh, this afternoon. I can't make it. Um, I apologize. What's another solution? But hit it on the head and, and, and address it with people. But ultimately, just do what you say you're going to do. Um, Fifth, I would say make sure that you understand how to, uh, to incorporate systems. <clears throat> I'm a big fan of systems. And I love this, uh, this quote that, you know, manage your systems, not your people. If you can manage your systems, it takes the emotion out of the, the process. It also allows scalability so you can go out and, and, and build it. Um, and probably the last thing that I would say is, uh, is have fun. Um, I look back at my, my, my two years that I was actually managing my own team of reps. And <clears throat> this might sound crazy, but that was actually my favorite. Yeah, it was my favorite two years of my career because a bunch of first year guys don't know what we're doing. And to be able to see that progression, to add value for them, and to be able to have all that responsibility on my shoulders, like the direct responsibility for this team, whether we win or lose, fail or succeed was all on me and the direct influence with those guys. And as a regional, regional vice president, you have tons of influence, that's great, but it's not that direct in the trenches yeah. influence with the guys. And I, I love that. So cool. if it's first year managing, just enjoy it. It's a great time. Yeah. Well, dude, I appreciate the time. This has been, this is very, way fun. I'm excited for you to go to Orcon and 
playing a part. Maybe we'll get you on a panel or something and let let us pick your brain even more there. For sure. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I think we're just getting warmed up. I know we're just getting warmed up. I know. I was like, we could go around too. So um, he'll definitely be in the university piece. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Um, but yeah, dude, thanks, brother. Hey, I just want to acknowledge you for getting it done, man. Love the energy, love what you're doing, the collaboration, synergy in the space. It's awesome, man. Thanks, dude. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay.